So good morning, everyone, and welcome to the EMA 2020 Piano Conference session. This session today uh, will be about vaccination and health system sustainability, how to prioritize vaccine investments in a post-COVID world. So a warm welcome to our speakers here today. Uh, I will introduce them in a, in a second. Uh, just to introduce myself, uh, my name is Silvia Romeo. I'm a project manager at Think Young, an NGO and think tank based in Brussels. We work with youth policies and young people. And we also do a lot of projects on vaccination. And there's one project that I really wanna just say briefly. We built um, the Young Coalition for Prevention and Vaccination in 2018, which is a coalition of young healthcare professionals advocating the importance of prevention and vaccination uh, among Europe. Um, I'm really happy and excited today to be here to present this session. A bit nervous as well, I would like to say. <laughs> but um, I will just go uh, deep into the points. Uh, the aim of this session is really to discuss and raise awareness about the routine vaccination programs and to huge the need to prioritize vaccine investment within the health system budgets. However, I will try to make this conversation really interacting and lively. Um, and I will try to say you know, a few points on the context of this topic before starting. I would like to say that this is a moment where healthcare systems and social care services are really under pressure, given the high demand and the limited budget that we have. Of course, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we are assisting to a severe recession, uh, which has been for nearly a century, it wasn't here. So we are really experiencing a delicate moment that really makes us understand what will be a world without vaccines. So vaccination remains the most powerful tool to prevent infectious diseases and to avoid the consequences that can arise. And that's what we are looking at now, right now. However, we just have to say that less than 5% of the total spending is allocated in preventive measures nowadays, and including vaccination, of course. This is a data that we would like to discuss today as well. This is something that we need to change. This is something that we think it's important to you know, to huge to member states, to European Union, to countries and to people themselves. So it is now time to rethink, to redesign, to reorient healthcare systems. And it's time to do so and try to, you know, find a sustainable behavioral change among people themselves. The European Union is already doing a lot during the latest years and also the countries, especially for example, with the 20, 2018 Council recommendation on strength and cooperation against vaccines preventable diseases. But it's time to do more. It's time to do more efforts. And that's what we would like to discuss today with our wonderful speakers. And I will just say a few rules of the game that we will have during the session. Uh, there will be some time towards the end for around 25 minutes of Q&A from the audience. So you will be really feel free to ask questions anytime during the session in the chat. They will be considered for, for later. You can address them to one speaker or to all the speakers as you really prefer. You can make comments on the discussion. And another important tool we will have today is the polls. In the meantime, just waiting for, for more people to join and to respond, I would just like to introduce the first speaker we have today, uh, Mr. Tim Wilson. Uh, welcome. Uh, Tim Winslow is uh, the Vice President of Charles River Associates in the UK. Uh, he focuses on projects involving the pharmaceutical sector and the retail financial services market. And I'm very happy for, for you to join today. And Tim will talk about the positive societal impact and economic values of vaccination and vaccines and the policies that can contribute to the prioritization of vaccination investment. So before giving you the floor, Tim, um, I will ask Chiara if you can just show the result of the poll. Okay, well, so the correct answer will be to up to 65,000. I see that most of the people replied up to 100,000. And this will be actually the number uh, of hospitalization avoided if the target flu vaccine could be reached to 75% as it actually is the target. But right now we have a vaccine coverage rate of for, 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 for 44,000 percent. Um, the second question is about vaccination expenses 
represent a minor part of healthcare expenses in Europe. And so which pro proportion of healthcare expenses is allocated to vaccines in new countries? We see here a result of less than 0.5%, which is correct. So it's nice to see that the audience really understood and knows the answers to this. It's a shocking fact. I mean, I also said it in the, in the very beginning, but I think we will have more time to discuss this uh, later today. So now really I will give you the floor team and um, we will have time also for some Q&A after your presentation at the end. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Sylvia. Hopefully everyone can see my slides. Um, thank you for that introduction, Sylvia. Uh, as, as Sylvia said, um, we're economists, Charles River Associates. We focus on policy issues in the life sciences area. I'm, I'm just going to spend uh, 10 minutes talking uh, about teeing up some of the issues I think we'll discuss more and more during this session. People may know CRA from our work for uh, the European Commission or national governments, but this draws on a series of projects we've done for Sanofi, so uh, thanks to them in, in advance uh, as well. What I want to talk about just briefly is the contribution of vaccines to healthcare system sustainability. Um, uh, it's probably the easiest sell at the moment, given the, the current situation we're in and the news of the last couple of days. But just to remind everyone, building on some of the facts that uh, Sylvia has just uh, set out and, and then give some thinking around the policies. And I'll go into two particular areas that I think are going to be particularly relevant uh, during uh, the end of, uh, of 2020 and as we go into 2021 uh, and then just finish with some conclusions and, and, and then obviously happy to take questions or, or take questions at the, at the end, as Sylvia suggests. Um, the contribution of vaccines to healthcare systems at the moment is this is almost a point that I think everyone um, would take as a given. But just to remind everyone of the, the facts that have been set out by the WHO, set out by uh, Vaccines Europe, etc. So vaccines are clearly one of the most effective interventions in public health. Uh, it's often said the, the second most important intervention after uh, clean water. And this delivers significant benefits both to the individual, but then this is truly one of the, these medical interventions where uh, there are a set of benefits that go beyond the individual to through herd immunity to society, through to the impact on healthcare savings costs, carers, and then there's a very good story that this has a, a, a positive uh, impact in terms of macroeconomy and growth, particularly in uh, some of the uh, lower income parts of the world. So some of the global health parts of this are, are, are well known. So children, we often think about vaccines in terms of children. That's, that's obviously a, 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 not the right way to think about it. It's life cycle uh, vaccination. But from the ch children perspective, this has obviously got a significant impact on mortality. We've seen the eradication of some diseases, the elimination or very close to it, and those, some of uh, are fighting their way back uh, of other diseases. If you leave the epidemiology for a second and you go in, sorry, and turn to the economics of it, the economics in some ways are even more uh, convincing if that's possible. Uh, so if you look at the, the US numbers, we're saving 14 billion of direct costs, 70 billion of societal costs. If you, if you look at rate of return on investment from a societal perspective, one dollar spent in terms of vaccines investment pays back ten dollars in the US. If you look outside of Europe and the US, those, uh, those multipliers are much higher. Uh, the recent research has shown one dollar investment gives you twenty dollars of return from a societal perspective. And then vaccines, often we think about this uh, in terms of uh, measles, influenza, but clearly the application of vaccine, vaccination is much wider uh, into cancer, into chronic diseases. Very important story on antimicrobial resistance uh, as well. So vaccines are delivering to society and, and have in lots of ways some of the most convincing evidence in terms of effectiveness and then from the economist perspective, cost effectiveness. So given that, uh, why, why are we worried? Why are we talking about this today? Well, at, going back to uh, the last time we had a big economic shock, uh, as Sylvia suggested, we've got a big health shock at the moment. 
going on with a, a pandemic, the experience of, of probably uh, the health experience of most of our lifetimes. But the associated economic shock of this is still in, in some ways in early days. We, we've seen the immediate shock in terms of the economy. We've seen some recoveries, um, but we have also seen this massive increase in debt levels. So we're all anticipating that's going to have economic ramifications for uh, years to come. Uh, and that is the projection from uh, the OECD, et cetera, in terms of uh, uh, growth in terms of the economies. What did we see last time we had a large shock to the economy? Uh, when we think about the, the Great Recession, 2008, 2009, we, we saw some very big decisions, maybe implicit decisions around uh, prioritization and allocation of healthcare spending. And you've got those numbers that Sylvia suggested that uh, I, th I think are really important, 5% on prevention, 0.5% in terms of vaccination. The concerning thing is when we last had to make large choices in terms of the allocation of health spending, we chose to push down prevention in, in many markets. And within the prevention budgets, actually vaccinations were actually hit even harder than prevention. So even in markets where, where healthcare spending rose, we saw prevention shrink. Even in markets where prevention <laughs> was maintained, we saw reductions in vaccinations. I'd be very interested to hear the more recent story in Italy uh, later uh, in, in this session. So the big concern is when we see large pressures on of austerity and economic bu budgets, it's very tempting to reduce things which won't have seemingly an immediate impact today and may not have a political impact, preventions and vaccines. Now clearly this is much more complicated this time around uh, because one of the big investments we're going to have to make in, in healthcare is the COVID vaccine itself. And that may mean that we have choices within vaccines. How much more do we spend on COVID vaccines and what does that do to the rest of the vaccine budget, the routine uh, vaccines budget, which is so important given the numbers on, on the previous page. So what can, happens in 2021 is not going to be the same as what happened in 2010, 2011, but the danger is clearly there in terms of what happens to our prioritization, our decisions around prevention, vaccines, and types of vaccines. And therefore, there's a huge debate, and I'm very much looking forward to it in this session today, as to what does that mean in terms of good policies for funding prioritization? Is this all about moving the decision around funding to be much more forward-looking? There's a big debate around horizon scanning a big debate about us looking forward to where vaccines can deliver uh, to budgets. There's a big debate about what's better, a ring fence budget that focuses on vaccines, a ring fence budget that focuses on ch childhood vaccines and adult vaccines, a, a budget within a healthcare budget where we can flexibly allocate across the piece. So there's a big question as to what better protects routine vaccinations in this very difficult and challenging time is it better for COVID vaccines to be included as part of the vaccines budget or for that to be an emergency fund around the vaccines budget? So there's questions as to how we choose to prioritize money, how we take into account those rate of return on investment numbers. And then there's questions, and I'm sure we'll come back to this later on in terms of the governance uh, and the structure of vaccines. What does this mean for the structure of that decision making in terms of uh, both who makes those decisions and how it fits in with the rest of the healthcare spending? One of the real concerns and risks when you see austerity is not that we see a 10% reduction in vaccine spending or a 15% reduction in prices. That hasn't tended to be how it's worked in vaccines. What's happened is we've just put more and more pressure on procurement uh, and particularly saying to the procurers, well, shouldn't we be making greater use of competition in vaccines? Uh, and so we've spent quite a bit of time looking at uh, different types of procurement methods, comparing price only single winner tenders to broader multi-criteria split tenders and, and saying well which of these is better in the longer term and looking at the experience when we put a big focus on price only tenders so we've drawn on some of the experience in, in Germany uh, some of the experience in Italy and how that's interacted with some of the debate uh, around vaccine hesitancy and anti-vaxxers uh, etc and our conclusions and there's a, a reference at the bottom to the paper uh, is that it really focusing very in the short term on savings for procurement isn't actually good for sustainability, even in the relatively short term, in the medium term. And you should try to get sustainable competition 
rather than price only uh, competition. It is better to include some value added services, though we know how difficult it is to measure and define those, but they're very intimately linked with awareness and coverage rates. And if you do that, you can achieve this uh, holy grail of higher vaccines coverage rates, the sp supply sustainability and incentives for the longer term. So this is, uh, I think, trying to warn us against putting too much pressure on the procurers to get generate some savings from routine vaccination. This would be a short term benefit, uh, short term small benefit with really large long term costs. So uh, wrapping up, uh, hopefully I don't need to persuade anyone of the, the, uh, the benefits of vaccinations, but just to remind everyone of these very impressive rate of return numbers, these wide uh, dimensions of value that vaccines deliver, and not just think about childhood measles, this is about a much wider range uh, of different vaccines. Historically, prevention of vaccines have done very poorly out of economic shocks. It won't be the same this time, but let's make sure it's not the same in a different way. Um, there are efficiencies in what we've learned from COVID. Uh, we won't be able to apply all of those in the post-COVID environment, nor should we, but some of them, particularly reducing the amount of time it takes for vaccines to be incorporated into immunization schedules, that's something we could truly uh, benefit from. And then thinking about what these policies are, as Sylvia suggested, a sustainable approach to funding prioritization, that clearly is the case. We've spent too long muddling along in, in this area. We need to do this in a more systematic process. And we shouldn't be using procurement as a, a de facto tool for cost savings. We should be using that to manage sustainability. So I, I will stop there. And over to you, Sylvia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim, for, for this presentation. Uh, it's nice to see how there are different aspects related to this topic. And, you know, also talking about the post pandemic is it's very important because it's a crucial, it will be a crucial moment. Right now we are experiencing the middle of the pandemic, but of course there will be a post moment where we will need to recover, we will need to do more, and we will really need to more efforts in, in terms of everything about healthcare. Uh, so, so I think there will be some time later for some Q&A questions from, you know, the audience um, at the end of the, the session. Uh, and right now, I would like to introduce the next two speakers we will have today. Uh, we have Dimitra Pantelli and uh, Francesca Colombo. Uh, first of all, thank you for, for joining us. And I will just say a few things about both of them. Uh, well, Dimitra Pantelli is a program manager at the European Observatory on Health Systems and Policies in Belgium. Uh, she joined in October 2020, but uh, she spent more time, in a, more than a decade actually, uh, the Department of Healthcare Management at the Berlin University of Technology. Uh, her work focuses on evidence-based decision uh, making in healthcare and primarily healthcare um, technology assessment. And uh, Francesca Colombo on the other side, um, she's the head of the health division, uh, the OECD, the Organization for Economic uh, Cooperation and Development. And she has over 20 years of experience uh, leading international activities on, on health and health systems. So really, really nice to have you both here today. Um, I will uh, start uh, with Dimitra asking you some questions you know, on uh, financing of vaccines. And I would like to ask you, how are vaccination services financed? And how is this different among vaccination themselves? And how do you think it is important for achieving higher vaccination rates? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sylvia. Thank you, everyone, for, for having me. I, um, I think I will, I will start by linking two of the things that, that Tim said we, and what you said, Sylvia. I mean, we see that there is a very, very little share of the, of the health uh, budget or of health expenditures going to vaccinations. And actually 0 0.5 is the maximum end of the spectrum. There are countries where we have as little as 0 to 5, I think, or even less. Um, and Tim made the point at the end that, you know, we shouldn't look at procurement only uh, for savings. And I think what's really important here to understand, and it, it links to what I'm going to talk about in a little bit about financing, is that when we talk about immunization programs, we don't only talk about procurement of the vaccine itself. So it's very hard when we look at the number to know if this is money that goes into procurement of the vaccine as a vaccine, or a financing of the services, or financing of information campaigns. So it's a lot of different components, and all of them are important. Um, here at 
at the observatory two years ago, uh, colleagues did a comprehensive study, also working together with the European Commission, on the way that routine vaccinations are, are organized in European countries. And I would like to encourage everyone who's interested, and I'm guessing by being here today, you are interested in the issue, uh, to look up the study. It's uh, open access on the observatory website. Um, to look exactly at this issue, um, coming from the, of the from the origin of outbreaks of measles and of vaccine preventable diseases that were not uh, observed previously and that were increasingly observed in the last few years um, to understand a little bit better what we can do better moving forward and I think as both of you mentioned looking at the challenge that we are looking at now this is more timely than, than ever. Um, Clearly, uh, going back to, to Sylvia's question, it might be different uh, or important to differentiate between childhood vaccinations and adult vaccinations or different types of vaccinations within countries. Most importantly, I think, is the differentiation between the national vaccination program included vaccinations and those that are not included because, accordingly, they are covered or not covered by the statutory health system. And this plays a, plays a great role uh, when it comes also to patient access and to the extent to which we can expect to have success uh, with the vaccination coverage. So if we look at the European context, and this is very different in the global context where different financing sources come into play, when we look at the European context in most countries, the way vaccines are financed mirror the predominant financing system for health um, technologies and health services financing. And in different countries, this is different. In some countries, we have general taxation. In some countries, we have social health insurance contributions. But this, um, this varies according to, to the country. In all the countries that our study looked at childhood vaccinations, and I have to mention here, uh, the study had two tracker interventions, so measles vaccinations and influenza vaccinations, one childhood vaccination and adult vaccination. Um, so the, the generalization is quite good in terms of other um, vaccinations in the programs, but just to bear this in mind, methodologically speaking, childhood vaccinations financed usually through the the predominant type of health financing in the system are free of charge uh, at the point of use. Um, the same is the case for adult vaccinations here for influenza, uh, for those risk groups that are covered within the national immunization program. There are only some countries in Europe that require a certain degree of cost sharing for adult vaccinations, but these are um, in the minority. This is important to uh, mention here because cost sharing is a known financial barrier to access for um, technologies. It's also a known lever to discourage um, misuse of services and waste. Um, but in this case for vaccinations, this is largely, largely uh, less applicable. And if we look at the current situation and the way, for example, um, the European Commission um, is working in their communication, they encourage uh, member states to provide COVID vaccines free of charge. So this is a clear, the clear tool um, for uh, increasing accessibility for patients. Um, so, of course, different countries have individual perspectives about which mix of funding um, is the best. And we have different examples, for example, for, uh, for childhood vaccinations in Austria, which is one of the, at least in our study, is one of the exceptions examples where for, Im for adult immunizations, cost sharing is required. Um, for childhood vaccinations, there is a mixed funding uh, part um, whereby we have a part funded by a part of the program funded by the statutory, uh, the central budget, I think it's two, uh, two thirds, and then there's one part uh, funded by the local budgets and one part funded by social health insurance. So this is a mix of funding sources. In other countries, this is different. Um, so we also have a situation where because we have to think differently between the vaccine itself and the services, there are countries where the vaccine might be covered by the service itself is not covered or in, and that is, I think, the case, for example, in Ireland. Um, or uh, where we have, of course, exemptions for low income people or inversely in, 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 inverse in Finland, where because the vaccination service itself, the, the actual injection um, and consultation with the physician is part of primary care those who are not included in the national vaccination program for adults, for instance, might have to purchase the vaccine themselves, but then the service is covered. So you see there is a different uh, composition um, of, uh, of elements that all need to be thought of when we design uh, vaccination programs and especially when we think about what all the elements that we have to take into account um, in order to be able to project um, for sustainable financing. 
Um, one thing that is important in this case, I think, where we're looking for, as, as Tim mentioned, the role that suddenly needing to vaccinate a large amount of people on top of the routine vaccination that we need for other things, is that most likely, and we see that also, and we come back to that, I'm sure, later on, um, with the initiatives um, at international collaboration, collaboration now with the COVID vaccination uh, purchasing, most likely you need different approaches. So you cannot rely on the usual resources that you have also for this huge concomitant vaccination um, because the expenditure will, will depend on the large, the size of the vaccination cohort that is not immunized. Also the demographic um, composition. And there we also have country examples that might be useful to think of. Uh, I can think of one example in Germany for the H1N1 uh, epidemic in 2009, where there was uh, in Germany, perhaps as a background information, the um, Vaccinations that are covered by the National Immunization Plan are part of the mandatory benefit basket of the social health insurance system, so they are covered. Um, when the epidemic was uh, happening in 2009, the social health insurance, um, the sickness funds, the social health insurance payers came to an agreement with the state um, that the social health insurance would cover jointly 50% of their insured, and if they're their, their joint pool of funds was exhausted, then the state would jump in and finance the rest. So creative ways of thinking about financing are required when you have a situation that is far beyond what you usually have in your planned vaccinations program. I think I, I wrap up here for the moment. I'm sure you have further, further questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Dimitra. I mean, it's nice to, to see and to discuss that we will need indeed different approaches for the deployment of of this vaccine. I mean, we have here heard some some news now, which uh, made people think that you know it's 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 gonna be over soon. Or anyhow, we will find a solution soon. So, from from the side of healthcare professionals or from the healthcare world, we need to to find more ways to to approach this and to lead the access to payments in a smooth way. So that's that's very interesting to to hear from this. I'm sure people will have a lot of questions on you know COVID-19 and the vaccine and how we can uh, we can handle this. Um, I would go now to, to Francesca Colombo. Um, thank you very much, Francesca, also to, to be here. I hope you can hear me. And I don't see you right now, but I, okay, I see you now. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Um, so, Francesca, I just briefly introduced you before, and I will ask you a couple of questions um, just on the economic consideration for, for investment. So, I would like to, to know from you, like, how do economic considerations for investment and financing in vaccines differ to other pharmaceutical products? And how do these considerations vary across the EU? Because it's also nice to see how this can, can change across the member states. And is this comparable to the rest of the world indeed? Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity uh, uh, to speak. Uh, so yes, I mean, I'm, I will address the question, but obviously let me start by reminding what Tim was saying, that obviously there is a, a very strong, not just value of vaccination in terms of health system sustainability, but really in terms of economic uh, sustainability. So the economic value, it's certainly something to put forward. We see it dramatically in the context of uh, COVID-19, and if you even look at the contractions that um, OCD countries have been experienced, or even the EU countries, in the in the uh, first quarter, in the second quarter of this year, relative to the first quarter, we see contractions in the order of uh, eleven percent. And obviously, I mean, you could argue that if you had a vaccine, if uh, we had been able to have very very quickly vaccine, which obviously we know take time, uh, those would <coughs> help to address some of um, the economic consequences. So I think it's important to remember that it's not just an issue of health system sustainability, but that the sustainability of health systems are fundamental for the economic sustainability of our societies. Now, some economic considerations on investments in vaccines. Um, there are certain things on which vaccines are similar in a way uh, to other pharmaceutical products. Uh, they rely very much on some basic research, which is uh, done through scientific knowledge into biology and into the disease, uh, very often that receives also uh, public funding. And then there are also private firms which invest in applied research and development in 
the clinical trial developments uh, in marketing authorizations, manufacturing and distributions, uh, and so forth. And those uh, uh, private investments are incentivized by a profitable market. That's for pharmaceutical technologies uh, in general. Uh, and that's something which in some ways is applicable also to uh, vaccines. But there are important differences in uh, relation to vaccines um, relative to other small molecule medicines. And in a way, you can think of vaccines as being the full relations in pharma. Um, the vaccine market is quite small. Um, the numbers have already been, been said, but yes, uh, those are pretty much correct. On average, across OECD countries, 0.3% of health spending uh, is devoted to vaccine. Uh, just to put a figure into that, so that it's equivalent to um, 10 US dollar per capita uh, per year. And that compares to about 4,000 um, health spending per capita per year. So it's a very, very, very tiny uh, fraction. It's a tiny fraction also in the prevention budgets. And we know that prevention is incredibly small in health, uh, total health spending. So it's only about 3% of total health spending. We have for many, many, many years at OECD trying to really talk about the economic benefits of investing in prevention. Uh, but still, despite all those uh, analyses that point to the importance of uh, prevention, and with that also vaccines, we still very, very little spending. And it's true that in the context of the contractions of the crisis, those budgets are less protected. That's what we have seen in the context of the uh, previous uh, crisis and pandemic. Now, I think there are other reasons uh, why mm, the, the markets for vaccines are, are, are small. They have to do both with supply and with demand side issues. And if you look at the uh, supply sites, um, vaccines are not as attractive as other um, investments in, uh, in, in pharma. Um, they are actually quite expensive uh, to develop. They are quite expensive uh, uh, you know, to, to produce. Um, they, there are fixed costs, which are really quite uh, high for the development and the production and supports. Um, on the other hand, they have to be priced quite modestly in order to make them affordable. Uh, for entire population and that's fundamental because as what was mentioned you need to have a high rate of uh, vaccinations to ensure the population protections and so you want as large as possible um, a population to <coughs> have access uh, to vaccines and uh, be vaccinated so if you consider that you have low prices and high production costs it's quite clear that the margins are quite low and so that makes it uh, quite uh, less attractive uh, from uh, uh, a pharmaceutical uh, perspective. There are issues also on the demand side that make the market uh, uh, small because having affordable vaccine um, does not help if people don't, do not take them. And it's, uh, it's quite clear that at least across OECD countries, the financial barriers to having a vaccine are very, very, very low. Um, they're almost exclusively, or exclusively in uh, OECD uh, countries financed through governments or through social security contributions. So there is a very, very little tiny share of out-of-pocket spending, which is involved. So it's not, in many cases, it's not really a financial uh, barriers, but there is a still low pickup um, of like populations. Uh, even if we look at the winter flu vaccines among uh, the elderly populations, um, before the pandemics, there is more demand, demand now in this current context, but only 41% of the elderly groups uh, have uh, a flu vaccination. So there is definitely a relatively low demand. And of course, there's the issues of uh, vaccine hesitancy that limits uh, uh, the market. And I think in a way, we need to rethink differently about something which are uh, in the main global public goods. There are some things that are fundamental for the sustainability of health system, for the sustainability of economies, where, however, the market incentives are low, where there are issues about demand side as well. And so how do we uh, make sure that we um, create uh, a set of policies of, and incentives that make sure that we can get uh, people vaccinated and get vaccines uh, to people and build on those externalities which are fundamental for having healthy populations, but also for having healthy economies. So there are different policies that obviously needs to be addressed. Uh, there are 
I mentioned the demand side issues and we know about vaccine hesitancies. Probably there is a lot more that can be done in terms of building channels of trusts. The governments need to uh, invent, uh, invest home um, in creating, making sure that they are competent, they are responsive, they are open, uh, there is integrity also and fairness. Uh, things, for example, about how we communicate around the safety and efficacy of uh, those products. Um, making sure that there is very, very transparent and upfront communication and engagement with citizens uh, about uh, you know, how vaccines are being tested, how uh, are they based and developed on evidence, uh, how uh, the market authorization works. There's probably much, much more that can be done in terms of building those uh, uh, channels of trust by, by uh, the populations and, uh, you know, making understand that the vaccines are, um, uh, there is an integrity process which is done um, and also that there is fairness in the way those uh, are made uh, available. I think there is uh, definitely an issue about thinking about budgeting, uh, bring funds to budgets, uh, how to make sure that those money do not uh, get cut in the context of crisis. Maybe this crisis with, you know, all the uh, the dramatic um, consequences that it has led to will lead to some more reflections. There's certainly much more understanding of the value of, uh, uh, of vaccinations, of the importance of uh, looking at uh, infectious diseases um, from, as mentioned, health, but also an economic standpoint. I think there is then a further issues about the set of uh, incentives that we have and how do we pay for global public goods. So if vaccines are really global public goods that uh, deliver benefits way beyond the person who is vaccinated, how do we make sure that we uh, rethink about financing models, uh, approaches even to science uh, and innovations, regulatory approaches in a way that really uh, make sure that the incentives are there. And this has to do with existing vaccines, which are fundamental. It has to do, of course, with future um, pandemics or future uh, threats that we perhaps don't know uh, yet, like the future crisis. How do we build resilience into the way we pay uh, for uh, uh, health systems in a way that is able to respond to future crises? So what type of economic incentives we need to put in place to make sure that we uh, incentivize a system to protect us in the case of future crises. And it's quite clear that one of the next future crises is going to be also the antimicrobial uh, resistance. Of vaccination can have also a role in, uh, in not only, but uh, not the only uh, policy, but it can have a role. But there's definitely fundamental questions of, uh, of situating the discussion on vaccine in this broader context of how do we pay and incentivize um, global public goods. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this. It was indeed very interesting to hear. I mean, the importance of building a resilient system is, is clear. Uh, we really need now to learn from, from this experience to, for a future crisis. But also, I was hearing your intervention here about vaccine hesitancy and this low demand that we have at the moment. It's true, we need to improve it. And it's nice also for me, Francesca, to, to mention policies because now we will have also other two speakers who will talk about policies from you know, a member state level, but also on European level. So I'm sure there will be also more thoughts from their side about this, but thank you very much. And uh, there will be for sure some questions at the end of the session uh, for you. Uh, I will take some time now, as we mentioned in the very beginning, for those who joined later, we have now some polls uh, during the session uh, and the audience can freely uh, interact with us and just respond and see uh, the results together. So I would kindly ask uh, Chiara from the EMMA team to, okay, I see them. So the first one is about robust prevention and vaccination budgets monitoring in Europe. Uh, if your country is is monitoring and publishing the budget spent on vaccines each year. So I see we have a lot of you know, people from uh, different countries. It's a very international audience. So please feel free to, to answer this question. And the second one is about vaccination budgeting, uh, a complex process which needs to be anticipated and sustainable. Who is deciding on budget allocated to vaccines in your country? So I would kindly ask couple of moments and in the meantime I will present the next speaker before seeing the results and 
uh, would like to introduce now um, the Professor Carlo Signorelli um, that I see now is disconnected. So I will just stick to the results of the uh, question indeed. If Chiara, you can show me the results. Okay, so most of the people, uh, it's, it's a no. Uh, does your country monitor and publish the budget spent on vaccines each year? Um, some, some of you don't know, and some of you say yes. So it, it really depends on the countries you're coming from. Also now, you know, information are distributed uh, there. So it, it really can change a lot. And um, vaccination budgeting, uh, who is deciding on budget allocated to vaccines in your country? Okay, National Regional Ministry of Health, uh, that's, that's good. And some of you are saying um, EU institutions. So I will say that we will talk more about this now. Um, if it's okay um, for you, uh, Chiara, we'll just go to uh, MEP Christian uh, Silvio Busoi, since uh, Signorelli right now is having some problem with the connection. Um, so hi, good morning, and thank you very much for joining today. I know you are very busy, so we really appreciate your presence here, as of course also the, the other speakers. And uh, just to introduce you um, briefly, uh, Dr. Busoi is a member of the European Parliament uh, since 2007. Uh, he is a member of the MV Committee, so the Environment, Public Health and Food Safety Committee. And uh, I will ask you a couple of questions to understand more really what are um, the European policies that can be discussed at the moment, also in view of you know, the, the moment that we are living right now, but in terms of vaccination um, investment in general. So um, I would like to ask you first, what are the European Union priorities in terms of vaccination? Can you tell us a bit more about this? And welcome again. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, <clears throat> happy to, to be here in, in uh, this very important and interesting debate. I'm also the chair of ITRE committee, Industry, Energy and Research. And research is extremely important also when you talk about vaccination, uh, mainly when you talk about uh, COVID, uh, because uh, without uh, boosting research and investing in research from uh, public funds and also private, the pharmaceutical companies will not be able to to come with new vaccines. And I'm also the rapporteur, the responsible person of European Parliament and of Envy Committee for the next health program, which is EU for Health. And there uh, I included, and it was voted in European Parliament last week uh, as a priority of the program to reduce vaccine hesitancy and to promote uh, vaccination. What we have today is the situation and reality where COVID-19 crisis has clearly proven European Union's need for uh, well-defined and adequately financed policy instruments. Also, this crisis revealed shortages. Shortages in the supply of equipment in hospitals, in sufficient medical human resources. Uh, the crisis had deepened uh, medicines and vaccine, vaccines shortage. And uh, of course, uh, this is also something uh, linked to the need to have uh, digital tools and to have the maintenance to access to essential goods and services. Uh, also, in particular important, this crisis accentuated our urgent necessity to strengthen the resilience of uh, national health systems uh, and make the transition from a disease center to patient-centered uh, approach. Uh, to, uh, to respond to your question, uh, to answer to your question, of course, uh, one of the directions uh, with what, with what is uh, the strategy is to look a little bit closer to innovation and to incentivize uh, more and more uh, innovation because uh, not only for COVID-19, I mentioned uh, earlier uh, that without uh, innovation was impossible to, to discover the vaccines necessary to get back to normal, but also in other cases, uh, when we talk about uh, vaccines, uh, we need to improve innovation and to uh, support better uh, innovation. And uh, this is something that we'll focus uh, in the coming years. Uh, we have at our disposal the uh, program of uh, uh, research framework, uh, which is uh, Horizon Europe, the continuation of Horizon 2020. And there uh, it will, will have uh, possibilities and opportunities to finance uh, 
research also in the area of vaccination. Uh, also, uh, what uh, we face today is the increase uh, of vaccine hesitancy. This was already in 2018 a major concern in the EU. You remember uh, the, one of the important addresses of the former president of European Commission, uh, Mr. Juncker, uh, uh, discussing openly the situation of vaccine hesitancy, even giving two examples uh, of countries, Italy and Romania. I'm from Romania. Uh, professor, the distinguished professor that will speak uh, after reconnect to this is from uh, Italy, I understand, and it will we'll discuss the Italian cases. There, two countries uh, were, were, uh, were uh, mentioned explicitly uh, as a big concern for uh, reducing the vaccination rate. Uh, vaccination, uh, reducing vaccine hesitancy and promoting vaccination was also uh, uh, part of the priorities of the new European Commission. It was mentioned by new president Ursula von der Leyen and is part of the work that Commissioner Kyriakides, a um, very energetic and extraordinary commissioner for, for health, will, uh, will uh, have among uh, her uh, priorities. We have the situation where 45.5% of the Europeans uh, thought that time that vaccines are uh, not safe. I'm talking about uh, 2018 moment. And uh, this approach will hinder the immunization campaign expected this spring uh, as well. Uh, we see mainly on the uh, social media, a lot of uh, fake news and campaigns against vaccination and uh, you will see the situation in spring uh, where uh, a lot of European citizens uh, will refuse or will not be enthusiastic at all to vaccinate themselves uh, against COVID. I'm not talking about the other vaccines, of course, where the situation is as we know that uh, we see. This in the context where uh, it's clear that vaccination prevents an estimated 2.5 million deaths each year worldwide. This is something that uh, is uh, scientifically proven. And of course, uh, uh, beside the preventing these uh, deaths, also vaccination reduces disease specific treatment costs, including uh, antimicrobial uh, treatments. So another uh, direction of action uh, to answer to your question will be to reduce vaccine hesitancy and to improve vaccination, to promote vaccination and this will uh, also be part of the European uh, European efforts, but this will be also will have to be also part of the national or regional uh, actions, and uh, the European institutions, European Commission, European Parliament will uh, explicitly ask to member states to act in uh, this uh, direction. Of course, uh, in the last years, the Council of European Union adopted recommendations as regards vaccination, um, even uh, in 2000. 11, uh, we had council conclusions on childhood immunization. In December 2018, council's recommendation on strength and cooperation against vaccine preventable diseases. And uh, it is still emphasizing the importance of vaccinations. To finish, uh, from my perspective, solutions such as the implementation of compulsory vaccinations, along with penalties such as substantial fines or refuse access to state schools is not a solution that could be feasible for all countries from European Union. Uh, I have know well the situation and the de public debate in my country, Romania, and I'm sure that uh, this is the same uh, situation in many other countries. So uh, to, to have a very strong compulsory and with uh, strong penalties will not work. But uh, of course, we should find some balanced measures in order to promote vaccination or even to, to, to put some fines to, to those parents which do not accept at least uh, information. Uh, and this is something that uh, we are discussing and uh, in my country and could be uh, discussed uh, uh, at the European level also. Other feasible solutions will be improving communication strategies, boosting information campaigns across the EU in order to promote accurate science-based arguments and enhance member state citizens' knowledge and understanding about the importance of, immuniz importance of immunization against severe and sometimes 
fatal contagious diseases. In the context of EU action plan of vaccination, I stress that the key factor EU bodies and all the stakeholders involved need to focus on is, on, is the understanding of the behavioral drivers of vaccine acceptance. As this factor needs to be maximized, the chances of negative health effects resulting from vaccination needs to be urgently minimized at as close to zero as possible. As regards to the vaccination in case of the current pandemic, the Commission highlighted that a good vaccine must be efficient, safe, affordable, developed quickly, and able to achieve EU market authorization. And we have already a success story, and this week looks like we have the second one. Uh, we, we think that uh, by the end of the year, we'll have four or five uh, vaccines uh, which uh, are efficient, safe, affordable, and which will uh, achieve, will receive EU market authorization. So, uh, from this point of view, we have uh, at uh, our disposal the tools necessary in order to start uh, the vaccination uh, campaign in the spring in order to reduce the, the effect of uh, COVID-19. We need to ensure also that all member states receive their vaccine doses without delay. At the same time, we have a, already a mechanism agreed to have a pro rata uh, and uh, by the time the vaccines are coming, they will be sent proportionally to the member states, proportionally with the number of vaccines uh, ordered and reserved, which of course is very much linked with the population of each uh, member states. Finally, and this will be my final word, and of course I'm ready to, to answer to, to questions. Uh, I would like to point out once more that we are facing still a high degree of vaccine hesitancy in the Union, and we need to address this, but we could address it this with joint efforts together, both the decision makers, the doctors, the patient organizations, and of course the industry. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, very much uh, uh, Mr. Busoy. Um, Thank you for your European perspective. It's really important to see the difference, you know, between the European uh, Union, what is actually doing, and also the member states. So, as you were mentioning before, we will talk about it in a minute. And um, I'm happy to to hear your energy. And thank you very much for the work you're doing uh, throughout this pandemic. Also for all the European institutions, uh, we really hear your energy, and it's important to to see uh, results later and we, we really trust you. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, vaccine hesitancy is indeed something to be addressed as a priority. And we have it in mind, uh, also Italy had it in mind. And I would like to, for this reason, to just introduce uh, Professor Carlo Signorelli. I hope you can hear me. Um, just if I... uh, definitely, yes. I'm... Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, I will just briefly introduce you, um, uh, say a few words. Uh, so Professor uh, Signorelli is a professor of hygiene and public health at the University of Parma and Vita San Raff Salute San Raffaele of Milan in Italy. And uh, his research work uh, focuses on public health, epidemiology, environmental health, uh, health organizations and immunization policies. And really welcome to this session. And I would like to ask you a few questions, but I, I see you have also some slides to present, so I'll, I'll leave them at the end. But it would be great to hear more about the Italian case study and how really the introduction of the so-called Calendario per la Vita. So I'll leave you the floor and thank you very much again. Yeah, thank you very much uh, uh, from you. I hope you can hear me and uh, you can see also the short presentation I prepare uh, uh, to present uh, the Italian uh, study. Thanks, uh, Christian, uh, for having mentioned the Italian uh, uh, case. Uh, I, I was so sorry uh, about two years ago when I was invited uh, in Romania to present uh, the Italian case study. Unfortunately, I had a problem uh, on, on, for, for that meeting. Uh, 
and uh, mm, I was very sorry not to attend because uh, Italy as Romania as other countries were in some way uh, more involved than others uh, uh, in uh, the problem of vaccine hesitancy and the solution also at the European level. Um, just a few slides uh, to uh, explain uh, what was the situation in Italy and what uh, we did. Uh, that's uh, the decrease uh, of vaccination coverage uh, uh, that start uh, after 2011, the so-called vaccine hesitancy, able to uh, have uh, um, coverage rates uh, from the six important uh, vaccinations of the first year, uh, lower than the 95 uh, uh, percent of coverage uh, for children at 24 months. Uh, the situation was worst uh, for uh, measles, uh, mumps, uh, um, uh, where uh, the coverage rate was uh, lower than 90 uh, percent. The worst year was uh, 2014 in Italy, and uh, that uh, was also the year of the presidency um, from uh, Italy uh, of uh, uh, the Council of uh, the European Union. And in fact, uh, uh, in December 2014, at the end of the semester, uh, there was uh, a conclusion from the uh, Council of the European Union uh, uh, pushed by Italy but accepted by everybody in order to find out a solution to better policies uh, uh, to counteract uh, the vaccine hesitancy problem in all the European countries. And uh, what we are able to do in the year between 2015 and 2017 were two important points, uh, two important initiatives. The first one was a new uh, prevention, national prevention plan that was elaborated in years 2015 and 2016. Unfortunately, uh, it took about two years to prepare the new plan. Uh, and the second initiative was uh, at the mid of 2017, the so-called Mandatory Vaccination Act, new law, to extend the mandatory vaccinations in Italy from uh, four, that was the original number, to uh, ten. That was uh, voted by the parliament uh, with a lot of political discussion, but at the end, uh, as I will show you soon, the results uh, were uh, quite uh, good. Uh, this is uh, a paper that we published uh, during the discussion of the new uh, immunization and immunization plan uh, to show that uh, there was a cooperation between uh, uh, different uh, uh, components. In particular, uh, at that time, uh, Walter Ricciardi, most, some of you know him very well, was the president of National Institute of Health. Dr. Ranieri Guerra, that at the moment is the assistant director WHO in Geneva, but at the moment was the, was the chief medical officer. And um, our colleague uh, Roberta Silichini was the president of the Superior Council of Health and I was president of the scientific association. So there was a sort of cooperation between the scientific part, the ministerial part and the National Institute of Health in order to approve what we think was a good plan. Uh, I show you some data um, uh, uh, about the result of the plan, but of course the plan combined uh, to the um, new uh, law for uh, uh, immunization, uh, mandatory immunization. Um, you see that uh, in 2014 we were at about 93% for the exavalent vaccine, then went back over 95 and for uh, measles uh, uh, as a proxy of the MPR vaccine we were able to jump from 87 percent 
to approximately 95% in 2000 and uh, in 2019. That was uh, a good result. Uh, about one year ago, November 19, the European Commissioner uh, mentioned Italy as an example to follow for vaccines. Uh, we were able, with these two initiatives, uh, uh, the new plan with the support of all the scientific community institutions and, of course, the Parliament and uh, the uh, mandatory law. We wrote uh, about, again, one year ago, also a, an editorial he published on the European Journal uh, of Public Health showing uh, the good success of uh, uh, these uh, initiatives. And I'm happy uh, to mention uh, the presence uh, uh, among the authors of this paper of Beatrice Lorenzin, uh, that was a former uh, Minister of Health able uh, to give uh, the important uh, uh, political pressure uh, to these two initiatives. But unfortunately, unfortunately, what uh, we are uh, uh, now uh, seeing and observing is uh, a decrease in vaccines after uh, the pandemic of COVID, and this is a matter of uh, uh, concern, of course. We actually don't know exactly um, what was the reduction uh, we are able to measure it uh, by the end of this year. But of course, uh, we uh, uh, completely agree um, following uh, the words from WHO and UNICEF for a, a, a decline in vaccination during uh, the pandemic COVID-19. In particular, in Italy, uh, we were able to reduce the reductions uh, in about 5% uh, from the 2019 rates uh, for mandatory vaccination, but for all the other vaccination, uh, the decrease uh, was uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, much higher. These are some uh, data showing uh, the effect uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, on the campaign in different uh, countries uh, in the world. And this is the worst, uh, uh, the most important problem we have, uh, a, a very uh, strong reduction of uh, uh, vaccination in adolescence uh, and also the screening uh, programs uh, that is something related to prevention activities uh, in our uh, country. We try to explain the importance of vaccinations. Uh, in particular, we use uh, COVID and SARS-CoV-2 virus as an example of how can the disruptive virus uh, when a vaccine is not available, but this uh, is not uh, uh, understood completely. If it's true that not all the population is ready for a COVID uh, vaccine, if uh, it will become available in the next month, we try uh, to uh, push uh, uh, the uh, influenza vaccination, but uh, with a lot of difficulties related to the fear of uh, the people to go to uh, vaccine centers, uh, but also some organization problem uh, related also to the pressure uh, on the National Health Service due to the pandemic, in particular uh, in this period of time, the second wave uh, that is at the maximum level in Italy at this time. Uh, these are some uh, data taken uh, from uh, 19 countries in Europe considering the acceptance of COVID-19 vaccine showing that uh, Italy is in on average around 70%. It means that 30% of the population at the moment is not ready for a vaccine against uh, COVID-19. And this is a matter of concern, of course, uh, should uh, an effective uh, vaccine became available in the next month, uh, as uh, uh, we all uh, hope. 
The Minister of Health tried to increase uh, the categories uh, uh, to offer uh, the uh, flu vaccination uh, this uh, season. In particular, uh, the Minister of Health uh, they consider all the subjects eligible and, of course, uh, uh, included in the categories where the vaccine is free of charge, a subject uh, under the year, uh, over the year of uh, 60, and including also children from six months to six years. It will be interesting uh, at the end of the campaign to see um, how our rates uh, in the new categories, but unfortunately, I can say that the preliminary data show that the acceptance uh, was not so high, uh, not only for uh, the people and the population, but also for the organization difficulties in organization uh, the uh, campaign. We have also an additional problem as country that uh, we have a national plan, but uh, the, um, there is no national level of procurement uh, for vaccination. So there are 20, there are 21 system, uh, very heterogeneous uh, uh, and sometimes not very uh, useful uh, to support uh, the vaccination uh, campaign. Uh, I finish my 10 minutes uh, being available uh, for further comments and answering uh, some questions, trying to, uh, hoping to have uh, uh, present the picture of uh, the uh, vaccinations in Italy at this time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Signorelli, for, for giving us this uh, information on the Italian case study. It's, it's really interesting. I mean, I'm Italian, so I know it very well, but it's really something um, to consider among, you know, as an example. And indeed, I think some countries can learn from, from, from Italy, unless, I mean, of course, not considering this, this moment that we saw the decline in vaccination rates uh, in, in all Europe. So this is a, um, really a crucial moment for us. But we will uh, do more. We will do more efforts. We said we will work more uh, and it will be a joint effort also as Mr. Busoy was, was mentioning. Um, and now uh, really I see that we have 20 minutes left. Uh, so thank you so much for, for all your speaker interventions. I will launch the last poll of the day. So maybe we can also comment on this. So uh, should your country increase, prioritize or change uh, their vaccination budget, budget model? is the first question. And has this case study provided you with the best practices that could be applied in your country? So I'll take just a couple of moments from the audience to respond. I don't know if any of the speakers in the meantime have something else to say or uh, added information, some interventions. Dimitra, I <laughs> see you. No, I think uh, it has. It was mentioned by more or less by everyone on the panel the importance of vaccine hesitancy. There is work done on this by the expert panel on investing in health, by the Vaccine Confidence Project at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and others. And I think, particularly for the COVID vaccines, exactly because we have the accelerated processes, and exactly because this whole pandemic started with conspiracy theories targeting vaccination specifically. I think we have our work cut out for us. So if we had issues before, I think this is going to be even harder now. So I think there is a lot of, of thinking that needs to be uh, put into it. And my personal view is also the corresponding funding in how to, how to tackle this. Thank you. Thank you very much for this. Uh, it is indeed very true. I think it was mentioned several times. So it's time really to, to act on this. And uh, Team, I see you unmuted yourself, so if you want to say something. Thanks, Sylvia. Just, uh, I suppose the one point that hasn't come up uh, yet is, um, and it's, it is seeing some opportunity uh, out, out of this uh, crisis we've been through, uh, both in terms of the acceptance of vaccines, and I, I hear all the challenges, and I think that data is, is very, very telling, but I, I suppose there is an opportunity out of that. The, the other bit that I don't think has been mentioned uh, very much yet it is the the big logistical task we're going to have of pushing out the the COVID vaccine again represents a huge challenge but does represent an opportunity for us thinking about the the distribution of vaccines and and I think I think Dimitri your I think it was your point on trusted or maybe it was Francesca on tr tr trusted channels uh, and I think that's um, a really interesting point as to how 
we can deal with some of the logistical issues and also some of the trust issues. And then that maybe has a nice feedback back to vaccine hesitancy. So there could be some long running good things coming out of this, a terrible year, uh, you, you can hope. Yes, Dimitra, it was uh, your intervention, so. Yeah, no, I cannot uh, agree more. I mean, trust is one of the main issues. It also has been identified as a, as a facilitator and a barrier, uh, depending on how you look at it. And I think one of the things that I, I intended to talk about before I took my entire 10 minutes talking about other things was the role of primary care in normal vaccination, uh, pro in normal, in regular vaccination uh, programs. These are primarily delivered via primary care and there the providers, and that was, I think, Francesca's point, have a dual role. They don't just provide the services, but they also are a main point of information. So the trust between patients and providers is really important and I think particularly now when we need to figure out how to do this and we need to add modalities to the ones that we already have so I know for Germany where I, I have been working for a really long time before before coming to Brussels we have a new network of vaccination centers across the country we really need to also ensure that the health professionals who are delivering services are appropriately trained but are also trained exactly in this uh, communication um, and fostering trust um, element I think this is a, this is a great opportunity if we look at it that way also to take action here Francesca, please. Yeah, uh, there are a couple of questions in the chat. I don't know if you want some. I mean, I'm happy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I wanted to look at the results of the poll first, uh, just because we launched it. And OK, so we see that uh, it's a yes for um, the country prioritization of uh, vaccination budget and the model. And if Italy, the Italian case, really applied for a best practice uh, for European Union countries, so it's a yes from the majority. It's nice to see that. Um, I don't know if any of you wants to comment actually this result or Professor Signorelli, since we were talking about uh, this before. Um, otherwise, I would go to the questions from the audience. Well, we can go from the, to the question if there are. Okay. Perfect, yeah. To explain something. Yeah, the, I see uh, one question uh, saying thank you for this great panel discussion. Uh, would you say that investing more in prevention means investing less in treatment? So I don't know if Francesca, you wanted to respond to this. And there's Christian as well. I mean, uh, please. You want me to start and? Yeah, sure. Let's, let's I, do this I think it, it was mentioned that obviously investing more in prevention, it means reducing treatment costs down the line. I mean, that's uh, very simple. There might be a timing issue, though. Uh, that obviously, the savings that you might have down the line will not materialize immediately. So there is an issue of prioritizing the investments. And it might require uh, spending uh, a bit more. And I think in the context of the current crisis and that, also links to, I think there is a question uh, which has to do more, how do we shift spending in difficult times, um, which has really to do with how we put forward the arguments for investment in, uh, in health. And uh, by comparison, other sectors of the economy have been very, very smart in uh, putting forward um, the economic and societal arguments for investing, uh, whether it's uh, in the education, for creating human capital, um, obviously in the context of uh, thinking about uh, the need for a new green type of growth. And I think we need to start reasoning about how do we talk about a type of investments that will help to put economies and society on more sustainable growth path. And I think as part of that, definitely vaccines are an element. I mean, what are the type of investments that will lead you to sustainable and resilient health system. Prevention is clearly one of them. There are others, I mean, health workforce, uh, there is information systems, for example, there are lots, lots of things that needs to be done. But I think we need to change that conversations. So yes, there is probably a need for an investment first. It needs to be a little bit smarter. We need to be a bit smarter also in the way the arguments are put forward. Um, because this crisis, if, if anything, it has really uh, told us uh, and uh, taught us the importance of the smart investments uh, in the health system. And I think we need to build on the learning from, uh, from the crisis that we're still in the middle to, to really make a difference for the future. 
Thank you. Uh, if I sure. Uh, the the question is very good because uh, of course the resources are limited, and it's clear that uh, prevention will uh, will uh, give a clear result of reducing the burden of uh, treatments. But this result will come not immediately, in years, maybe decades. In the same time, uh, we should take into account that uh, the budget for health, which I would rather call uh, health investment than health spending, will not decrease. So uh, this is not like in a usual business where you invest some money now and then you'll have uh, lower costs in the future and better profit. This will not happen in health because we we'll have to cover more and more needs. The needs are uh, much higher than the possibilities to cover them. The most important result will be that if we invest in prevention, in some years or maybe more than a decade, you'll see the results and you'll have uh, the chance to cure other diseases or more patients or to give a better access, not necessary to cut budgets because this, not will, this will not happen. Of course, when you talk about a limited amount of money, the question is very legitimate. If you spend more money on prevention, from where you cut? But the, the idea is not to cut from treatments or from diagnosis or from other kind of uh, health investment, health costs, but to add money, to add new money. And this money should come with priority for prevention because the results you will see for sure. And uh, this will be also beneficial for the society. You'll have less people ill with uh, more productivity, productivity, with uh, more involvement in the economy, with more involvement in the society. And you, if you think in, this, uh, in these terms, you will find additional money, which is not a lot because prevention do not cost as much as treatments, for instance, and uh, the results will be there. But don't expect that you will uh, cut costs, you will have uh, lower budgets, for health because this will not happen you will cover other needs and the budget will increase more and more this is something that we also should think strategically because uh, at some moment will become extremely difficult to accommodate all the needs with the population which uh, live uh, uh, longer which is extremely good which uh, had uh, more uh, needs and uh, uh, more expectations from the health systems and which is also good but you have to, to find new ways of uh, financing this. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, anyone else wants to add something on, on this point? Um, otherwise, I will move to the next question just, from the audience. Just, just one very quick point. I, I thought it was great that Christian and Francesca both mentioned AMR. And the, the other part of building on Christian's point in, in prevention is prevention against future uh, crises and the resilience of the healthcare system. And we've got a brilliant time to educate the public that some of this investment is about avoiding things like we've experienced in 2020. And if that can be a living legacy of this, that would be, that would be very useful as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excuse um, me, if you allow me, I would have to sure. the next meeting. And, of course. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much for, for the questions, here. of course. Uh, in my capacity of chair of uh, industry research committee and also as the rapporteur for you for health and member of any committee but also the contact person between european parliament and emma european medicine agency i will remain very much involved in promoting vaccination in uh, reducing vaccine hesitancy and uh, in uh, investing in prevention in general so please count on me and we we'll stay in contact uh, and congratulations for the very interesting debate Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. And good work. Um, okay, so I still see a couple of questions. Um, there's one question uh, talking about uh, what are the key drivers for policymakers and budget holders to increase investment in prevention and vaccination? I mean, I know uh, the, uh, right now Mr. Busi left, but it's a question I think for, for all of you. What do you think are the key drivers for, for policymakers to, to increase investment indeed. Since you all come also from different countries, it's nice to hear what could be your, your thought. Francesca. So, I mean, I mentioned a few of these issues as well. I think we need to change the conversation and put in much more on the returns on investments. Um, very often in health, uh, we talk about uh, 
quality dailies, uh, cost effectiveness, which are very difficult for budget officials and for leaders really to uh, to understand. If you start talking about growth potential, if you start talking about um, employment, the uh, impacts on labor market, on uh, the productivity of uh, the workforce uh, and so forth, and even on, uh, in terms of pupils' um, ability to be successful in schools, I think it changed the conversations. I think we need to be smarter in uh, in that respect, and that is uh, is particularly important. So, we, you know, continue to do the the type of economic analysis that puts uh, very much the weight on the returns that you have, and also communicating that in a, in a way which uh, is understandable more by uh, by the decision makers and and leaders. And quite clearly, uh, facilitating also more budget discussions across health officials and budget officials. Um, in OECD, for example, we have uh, a, a group, an expert group that brings together health officials and budget officials. Um, and the very first time they met, it was quite clear they were talking completely different languages, completely different words. Um, so there is uh, much more that needs to be done in terms of bridging that gap and bringing different communities together. Um, yeah, those are just some initial thoughts. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's true. The, there's the need of a joint effort. Uh, Dimitra, if you want to integrate. I just want to shamelessly advertise work that uh, we're doing here uh, at the observatory. So we have a, a series um, that looks at the case for investing in health. Um, and this is exactly where we need to build on when, we, when it comes to this new challenge and take it as an opportunity. And as coming back to what Francesca was saying, there is a very nice video that was made for the Tallinn conference in 2018 uh, with a former minister of health in uh, the Netherlands who, were also the, who was also the former finance minister. And he's basically taking his two roles and talking to as the health minister and the finance minister. And it's exactly this point, sort of the different language uh, for people who have different roles but who have essentially a, a largely common a largely common goal and i think um going back to what um, um mr Bosso said earlier uh, it's important to distinguish between you know prioritizing within the healthcare budget and prioritizing outside the healthcare budget and for the healthcare budget and i think there's different discuss different discussions to be had in, in those two levels yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And there is a question I see for Professor Signorelli. Um, so the, the question is coming from just McNamara, who is also a member of the EPS organization, so the Pharmaceutical Students Organization. And the question is that in the Latium region in Italy, pharmacies have been allowed to administer the flu vaccine since October 2020. And some countries, including Ireland and the UK, and now some areas of Portugal, uh, vaccine reimbursement uh, burst by the state. So do you think that moving in this direction could have a big impact on vaccines rates? Yes, thank you. Uh, I would see that uh, uh, there was only a proposal, uh, but not uh, uh, an official authorization uh, to pharmacists uh, uh, to administer vaccine because this comes from uh, a law and uh, there was uh, some interpretation of the law. So there was a discussion if to use pharmacies uh, as a location uh, to administer vaccination. And I totally agree because uh, in particular in this, uh, um, this autumn uh, with such a lot of problem uh, in all uh, healthcare settings, uh, uh, we need uh, um, additional points for vaccination, but unfortunately the discussion is still on, uh, but there are uh, some difficulties. Last year uh, we did uh, a research showing that uh, in uh, about half of the European countries, uh, vaccines uh, are administered uh, in pharmacies. Uh, only half of them by pharmacists, uh, in the other half uh, there is healthcare personnel, uh, doctors and nurses uh, coming from uh, other uh, hospital or healthcare uh, uh, structure uh, and uh, staying and coming to the pharmacy. So the discussion is on, uh, considering the second part of the question, 
in Italy, uh, I forgot uh, to remember uh, during my presentation, but for all of you not very familiar, all the vaccination of the new plan are offered uh, free of charge from the National Health Service, including uh, in the essential level of assistance. Okay, then thank you. Thank you very much for, for this answer. Um, I would ask the speakers if you have a last point to mention before we, we close. Okay. Just um, one Tim, point. sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> one point that intrigues me uh, and it, it builds on the kind of the productivity story that I think Francesca was developing is the role of employers. Uh, and employers obviously are uh, uh, been hugely affected by this, this uh, pandemic. Uh, and, and making a great case in terms of investment in their sector, uh, but also vaccines benefit them and they, they have played an important role in some countries in terms of flu, vaccination coverage, other types of coverage. Uh, and I just think we might be thinking in terms of creative solutions, something around employers is, a, is an interesting area to think about. Sorry, Sylvia. Go ahead, go ahead, sure. I mean, exactly. It can also be in collaboration with, for instance, social health insurance payers. We see that also in some countries as examples, that it's not necessarily exclusively occupational health or exclusively the statutory health system, but that can be in, in collaboration as well. Great. Well, I think we got towards the, the end right now, so uh, I will wrap up. And I will thank you very much, uh, the speakers, for joining us today um, and taking the time to, to be here. Thank you for I mean, the audience to, to be this interactive and for, for attending this session. Thank you very much to the Emma team and Sanofi team for letting me moderate this session. It was really an exciting experience. So thank you everyone uh, once again uh, for all these insightful thoughts. And let's do more, let's work more for vaccine investment and have a nice day.